of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. We are in chapter 3. So said the first three chapters deal with what God has done for you, and the last three chapters deal with how you're going to respond with what He has done for you and how you and I live and walk our life or conduct our ourselves. It's important. Now, this life will be over with before you know it. You'll see, as, as my wife and I think sometimes, you know, where is all the time gone? It, it's just gone one tick at a time. One minute, one week, one month, one year at a time, one decade at a time. We're now on being married five decades. Some of you have already passed that, and you'll probably say, what happened to the time? I remember when my children were little and sitting on my lap. And now they're big and got little children sitting on their lap. And it won't be long that they'll have their own children sitting on their laps. That's the way it goes. That's the, that's the way it is. And so it's important that we walk worthy, as chapter 4 verse 1 says, of the vocation or the calling to which we're called. Not just our job, but more importantly, our calling in Christian character. I entitled this lesson, Not for the Faint of Heart. Not for the Faint of Heart. I, I saw on this, mor- this morning, I was watching uh, a, a YouTube video of, of a uh, large chorus of, of Ukrainians in a uh, tunnel singing hymns this morning. And it had that European sound to it. It's almost, you can hear it and you say, that's European in sound. Not a lot of low, real lows and not a lot of real highs like we have in a lot of our hymnology. But it was uh, very moving to see them all standing there, backed up to the wall, probably about 100, 75 to 100 of them singing hymns in their native language. Being a good Christian and standing up for the Lord is not for the faint of heart. If you're just a religious person, you won't find the strength in the hour of need. But if you have a spiritual connection with God, your conscience will have produced in you such a conviction that you will find it fairly easy to stand up against the winds of adversity. Because it is in the winds of adversity that you earn your rewards. You earn your, as it were, battle stripes or your your battlefield commissions and your rewards. Because those rewards are forever. They're not just something that you can just, it'll pass and fade away like earthly rewards do. They will never run out. As it said to Elijah in 1 Kings, the barrel of meal shall not be used up, neither shall the cruise of oil. It will never diminish. And so living faithful for the Lord now, this is our proving ground. This is our testing ground. It's not to become a playground, though we do play from time to time. It's, for the most part, a testing ground. But it's not for the faint of heart if you're to live right. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, those who live godly in Christ Jesus, not maybe, but shall suffer persecution. In other words, be scorned for living and having a biblical point of view, for standing up for the things that Jesus is the only way, and trying to live the faith in your life, your morals that go with that, being a demonstration of that that life. But we are in chapter 3 this morning of Ephesians, and we're looking at verses 10, 11, 12, and 13. 10, 11, 12, and 13. Paul is getting ready to jump into a heavy prayer when we get to verse 14. His second prayer of the book. But Paul would not only preach and teach the gospel truth to the Gentiles. He was a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, as you know, who got saved. He used to persecute the church. He got saved. He was of the, of the Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was actually a Pharisee teacher. And he would have been accustomed to hearing that the Gentiles were dogs. For 1,500 years they were called 
dogs, heathens. And many of them lived as they were, heathens. But many, eventually over the years, or at least some proselytized over into the Jewish faith for the right reasons. To be in the, in the understanding of God where they could learn, even though they would have to stay a little bit outside uh, of the center of worship because they were still Gentiles, but no more. But Paul would not only preach and teach the gospel truth to the Gentiles, he would also have to refute false teachers. So there are times when you and I as Christians not just give the gospel, but there are times when you are called on to defend the faith as an apologist of sorts. That's what an apologist does. You argue the facts of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, which means you must be sold that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes unto the Father but by Him. And so you, this is not a hobby. This is not just a religion. This is a conviction of the heart. I'm reminded of that. I'm sure you are as well. But Paul would also have to refute a lot of, a lot of various kinds of false teachers. A lot of different epistemologies or reasonings of the mind that came from those who were the field of Athenia and those who were uh, specialized, who have spe- great specialty in oratory. He would have to deal with those who were strong in the philosophy of that day, which was rich as far as they were concerned, as far as the Greeks are concerned. So Paul had to subvert or he had to refute those who would subvert and undermine the veracity or truthfulness of the soul-saving message of the gospel. The darkness, as we know, cannot comprehend the light. John said that in John chapter 1 and verse 5, And the light shined into darkness. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness overcame it not. In other words, the darkness comprehended it not. Our job is to help be good Christians so that the darkness can see light. Not somebody who just rattles their jaws in the darkness and acts like they're a Christian, but they actually can see the light of God coming through you and I. That is a tall order to fill. And you and I are not to judge one another as we attempt to do that, because sometimes we do stumble, sometimes we do fumble, sometimes we get a tad bit overzealous. But Paul came to reveal all that was in God to the Gentiles, All that God wanted man to see. And to do that which Jesus Christ wanted. And so Paul had a tall task of trying to convince people as much as he possibly could. Then leaving it up to the Holy Spirit to convince people that Jesus Christ was the Savior. And that the Jew and the Gentile were equal in Christ once they got saved. Now in chapter 3 and verse 10 where we pick up it says, Paul says in verse chapter 3 verse 9, uh, verse 8, Unto me who am less than the least of all the saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ has been revealed in the incarnation in his 33 years. That which was secretly not known much about God was demonstrated in the person and in the personality of Jesus Christ in his human life. When you saw Jesus walking the streets of Nazareth, that was God walking the streets of Nazareth. That was no less God than the God in the heavens, the Father and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, same Greek word, pneuma. That was no less God. When Jesus talked with Mary, that was the same thing as the Father talking to Mary. When Jesus took the bread and and distributed among the probably 15 or 20,000, not just five, but when Jesus distributed the bread and the fish, 
He multiplied the bread and the fish. That was the same God who spoke the sun out of his mouth into existence. That was the same God that breathed the Nephesh Kaya into the breath, the, the, the dirt in the ground and made Adam an, an animated living being. And Paul wanted to convey that our responsibility as Christians is to convey God to the world. Not to convey the world inside the church, but to convey God to the world. The church doesn't need the world. The world needs the church. The world needs the word. The church doesn't need the world. The church gets that all week. The church needs the word and the word needs to get out. And we should celebrate that we are in the body of Christ. Yes, indeed, when we are in the church, but always get that instruction. Paul wanted the wicked works of powers and principalities as seen in false teachers to be laid bare. And it would be the truth of God that would do it. He said in verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, because these things that are hidden in God that were in Christ Jesus, he wants them to be exposed now that all powers and principalities in the heavenly places might be made known by the church. That is the manifold wisdom of God. The Gnostics had their mysteries and their methods of capturing the minds and the hearts and the wild imaginations of the people with their elaborate methods of trying to elevate the minds of men into what is known as aeons or lifting or exalting you to a higher plane of thinking. That's something that transcendental meditation ascribes to. And there, those false teachers would try to call people into accepting a cosmic wisdom that the false prophets taught that took people not into a form of enlightenment, but into a darker, darker form of cosmic devilish uh, futures. The Gnostic teachers, of which there were several groups, assumed with the opening of their secret mysteries given to those who would be their disciples that those people would eventually ascend to a higher plane of human experience. But in truth, they were only descending those people into even darker demonic worlds. Once you leave the word of God, you have gone beyond God. You have gone darker and deeper into the darkness. We live in a world that has gone deep into darkness. And you can get used to living along the edge of darkness to where you don't know where the shadow begins and the shadow ends when it comes to light. And that's why the Word of God is something to draw us out to the light. Whether you're reading your Bibles and praying at home or during the week as you and I should, but on times when we can come together to be encouraged in the faith which is one of the purposes of the local church. But you live in the, if you do, if you and I live in the shadows between where the darkness is and where the light of God is, we will be like, uh, like Lot who hung out at the front gates of the Sodom and Gomorrah. And all of what we have is stained. We don't need that. And so the word of God that Paul would bring about through who Christ is and through what Christ's word is would help shed light on God in heaven. Without Jesus Christ being understood, you don't get God right. He is the face of God. He is not less. He is the same except in the second person. I'm one, Paul, Paul wanted uh, the, uh, the Gnostic, these teachers who had all these secrets. John dealt with them as well. They always claimed to have these secret mysteries that you could become involved with them and they could take you through the labyrinth of all the different ways that they could get you to start following them, like following a puzzle or of a corn maze or whatever. 
luring you in just a little more and a little more and a little more. Come on, come on. There's a carrot here. You get this. It's kind of like playing some of these video games and you can win, the, you can win this and you can keep a little further and you can hit that and you can win that and get you a little bit more advanced or whatever. And it's just sucking your brains out of your minds all it's doing. Wasting your time. But Paul wanted these Gnostics and these false teachers to also know that God has His mysteries too. And they're higher than greater than any mystery that mankind has. And it's in understanding Jesus Christ. You get to understand Jesus Christ, you will understand the Father. Because they are identical. Except two different personalities of the triune trinity. God's mysteries, though, are not meant to take you down into secret paths, but to reveal. God does not dis, God does not close things off from you. God reveals things to you who are of a right heart. God has His mysteries too, but they are revealed to set men free, not entrap, not entangle them in a form or labyrinth of bondage such as some cults do today, which call themselves Christian churches. They bring their people in and they entrap them into a form of bondage of which then they defend because they are a slave to that system. The Bible says the truth will set you free, not some church will set you free. The truth will set you free. Through the spiritually organic church, that is, you being baptized spiritually into the body of Christ through the spiritually organic church of His Spirit bearing witness with your spirit on a realm that's outside of the intellect and the physical. Through the spiritually organic church with believers being the body of Christ and Christ being its head, through us the manifold wisdom of God is seen. God and man are united in Christ our mediator. God is not a cosmic ogre, as the Gnostics claim. He is not one who keeps us down here to where the soul is bound to earth only, as they claimed. They were dualists in that regard. Paul also took on the crowds of Ephesus. And he was referring to, in verse 10, of the principalities and powers who seek to keep you and I in darkness, whereas God through Christ and His Word, seeks to bring you into the light. Paul took the crowds of Ephesus who adored the goddess Diana and this account is found in Acts 19, 23 through 41. So I'm just going to ask you to turn back to the, to the book of Acts chapter 19 just for a moment. Acts chapter 19, verse 23. Acts chapter 19, verse 23. There was an uproar at Ephesus, as my study Bible says, starts off that little section. It says, and at the same time there arose no small stir about that way. Remember, the way was the name of the early church. That's John 14 and verse 6, the people of the way. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the early church, before it was, they were called uh, Christians, at, 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 uh, at Antioch, they were known of as the people of the way. But anyway, no pun intended. And at that same time, there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain into the craftsmen. They, you had to be a part of, uh, of a yield. I mean, uh, uh, you had to be a part of a, of a group. And you had to be a part of those uh, that trade, and you had your different groups there that uh, would um, pay dues and everything else to set up their wares, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, "Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth, making goddesses, figurines, and such." 
Moreover, you see in here that none alone at Ephesus, but almost all throughout Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are no gods which are made with hands. That's right. And we're selling these things as gods. Again, you may think that such stuff as like this is silly, that people could make an object and then worship it. Worship in front of it. But I will remind you of the Hindu gods that were put in the building up behind the Burger King on exit 141 and the parade they put on their trailers and took them all through Salem, escorted them up there by police and had them installed in that building by their priest and not the police priest, but by the Hindu priest. And then in there, they, after installing the gods, after the priest said they're hocus pocus and burnt their candles, they were sufficiently satisfied that their gods were now possessed. And the priests left, they closed the doors. I don't know if the doors have been opened since. Maybe, I don't know. But I guess the priests could go then over to Burger King and get something to eat and a little crown to wear and go home. But I'm telling you, this junk goes on all the time. And so we don't live under a rock. And when we see something, we're so accustomed today to trying to make sure that no one, that we don't disagree with someone, that we're not even willing to tell them how to get out of hell and get into the light to get to heaven. We have gotten so where we are so scared of being politically correct that we won't even share the good news of the gospel with people anymore for fear that they may be offended and we might be hurt or not liked. When I'm telling you that when you preach the gospel, always remember that Jesus Christ was crucified, dead, buried, and raised from the dead. It's not going to kill you to be hurt by other people for sharing the truth. It's not going to hurt me. And Paul says, you are, you're spreading false gods here. Anyway. That's why there was an uproar at Ephesus. As we said before, wherever Paul went, there was either a revival or a riot. <laughs> and the only other time was with he was taking a nap nap. It was seepy time. <laughs> but anyway, so that not only, verse 27, that this craft is in danger to be set at naught, they're afraid that they're going to lose their you know money coming in. Verse 27. But also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised. And her magnificence should be destroyed. What did they tell the Israelites to do in the Old Testament in order for God to bring blessing back to the people? It wasn't that they just turned from their gods. They were supposed, they were ordered to destroy those idols. If you've got something that is an idol in your life and in your home, God tells you to get rid of it. Not just stop doing it, get rid of it. That's how violent God is. This is not popular preaching, I know. But I'm afraid that we have compromised on the mark that God has called us to. They were afraid that Diana should be despised. She didn't exist except in the imagination of demonically induced, seduced people. This was not a real person. Her other name was Artemis. You know, Artemis Gordon used to be on the Wild Wild West. That's where I remember the name Artemis from. You had to grow, you had Greek and Roman names for the same gods. You know that. But that Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed. Well, the only thing magnificent was of the craftsmen who carved her image, whom all Asia and the world worshiped. As far as the modern world of that day, this was a big deal. You didn't go up against the culture of Diana. You don't go up against the culture of the Green New Deal. You don't go up against the culture of the tree huggers and save the planet group. You just don't go up against them. They are pantheist. They worship the creation and the creature rather than the creator. They are reprobates, Romans chapter 1. Are you listening? 
They're reprobates, Romans chapter 1 says. They are devoid of moral judgment. And that's who Paul was dealing with. And when they heard these things, oh, they were full of wrath. And they cried out saying, Great is dying of, of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius, I had a friend I was in college with. He was from Australia, Mike. His name was Gaius, as he pronounced it. And Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered into in unto the people, the disciples said, uh, no, don't think so. You're not going in this way, buddy. And certain of the chief of Asia who were his friends sent unto him, beseeching him that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and the greater part knew not what reason they were come together. Again, Paul started to riot. Truth will make those rats angry. Truth makes liars uncomfortable. And a lot of time the liar has a tail. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all, all with one voice for about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Imagine just hearing that mantra for two hours. They were possessed. And when the town clerk had quieted the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not that the city of Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddesses Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be another myth. Seeing that these things cannot be spoken against, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For ye have brought here these men who are neither robbers of the temples nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, of Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him, uh, and that guild, that's the word I was trying to think of, the craftsmen that were with him have a matter against any man. The law is open and there are deputies. Let them accuse one another. But if you inquire anything against concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar. There being no cause for which we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. So what an uproar just for speaking the truth. With the various false teachings of the world, these are all they have. The world only has false teaching. The world only has hope in its moral uh, <coughs> uh, level or whatever it's at. That's all the world has. And all the world has outside of being saved is that thing which the world understands rationally and empirically. That is which I can comprehend by my feelings and flesh. What I can rationalize in my thinking. In other words, the world lives inside of its own echo chamber, not outside into the spiritual realm of God. God came to bring light in that dark echo chamber where people bounce opinions off of one another, one's just about as useless as the other. By thoughts of this world or by feelings and experience in this world, men are trapped by demons and or human viewpoint. And so, brethren, this is the world we live in. We live in a heathen, unbelieving, sometimes religious, yet still unbelieving world. Paul understood that. Getting back to 1 Corinthians, excuse me, Ephesians, my prior passage. Paul lived in this world. Peter lived in this world. Jesus lived in that world. You live in that world. And it's good for us to remember the world that we live in is not, a, is not close to God and it desires to, to, to live apart from God, unfortunately. We try to show them the light. The Jews still have a veil of unbelief hanging over their eyes, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 15. They still have a veil of unbelief. 
Paul says, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. You can read the Old Testament to most Jews and they cannot see Jesus at all in it. You can read Malachi chapter 5 and verse 2, which tells that the virgin would have the child in Bethlehem and that child would be from of old, from everlasting, that he was not a regular child and they still cannot see it. You can go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 where God says that the heal of the child of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. They cannot see it. You can go to Isaiah and read all the passages of how Jesus would be treated and they cannot see it. You can go to Psalm 22, 20, 20, 20, 22, 23, and 24. And you can see exactly in Psalm 22 the exact teachings of Matthew of the sufferings of our Savior prophesied and fulfilled, and they cannot see it. There is a veil of unbelief that is only done away in Christ. The human intellect cannot comprehend it. Darkness cannot comprehend that light. You wonder why you witness to your loved ones and your friends and your family and they don't seem to have any sense of urgency to see that their children know the gospel so that they might be saved because they don't comprehend the light. They don't understand. They've gotten accustomed to living in the dark. They have a form of spiritual myopia. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart, the Bible says. In 2 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15. Paul goes on to explain that only at the second coming of Christ will that veil of unbelief be taken away. The unbelief was impenetrable, both from the secular as well as the religious position of the world in that day as it still is today. It's hard. You and I cannot penetrate the unbelief of our loved ones or those that we speak to. We cannot. Only the Spirit of God can penetrate that. And the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit that will cut through to that. Only the Spirit of God can reveal the truth of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. The church body... Spiritually speaking, understanding the Word of God then comes to understand the glories of being in Christ. When you are in love with your spouse, it shows. If you despise your spouse, it shows. And likewise, in the body of Christ, when you really are in love in a biblical manner with Christ, it shows. No amount of religion, no label on the sign at the highway where you turn in or wherever you go to demonstrates that. You demonstrate that. I demonstrate that. Obedience and dedication demonstrate that. Unconditional love, obviously, is the capstone of that. So he says here that the church demonstrates to the world who Christ is. According to the eternal purpose, verse 11, which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, that He would come in the incarnation and die for us and bring us together. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. Verse 12. So we see the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ our Lord in verse 11. That purpose, I believe, is that mankind would see God in the person of Jesus Christ. And that the believer would demonstrate that same holy Jesus Christ to the world in living. Please understand that Paul is having all of this written down. This is something to be cognizant of. That all this stuff that he wrote, the Pauline epistles, in particular the prison epistles. Please understand that as these Letters are being written down. Of course, they're not in verses. They're not in chapters. It's just a long letter. That Paul is having all this written down as, as the Holy, by way of the Holy Spirit's inspiration while at the same time being shackled to a Roman guard. He is dictating this letter through an amanuensis, kind of a secretary, and he's writing it down. 
what do they call that little thing, the dictaphone or whatever they used to have, or they'd take dictation or whatever, or however that was. But he's putting it down as God wanted him to have it put down. And I'm sure he read it back to make sure it's what he said. But Paul is dictating this letter through an amanuensis, and then Tychicus, his fellow servant, would be sent out with a dispatch to take this letter to the churches. The sovereign will of God is not hindered by man or devil. A whole lot was put in Tychicus' hand who would take these dispatches out because these were the original autographs, not manuscripts. The original autograph. The sovereign will of God is not hindered by man or devil when God is using His faithful servants to do His will. It didn't make any difference where Paul would be in a palace or be chained to a Roman guard awaiting perhaps his death, though that didn't happen until later, his next imprisonment. But if you're willing to do the will of God, God will use you regardless. Whether you're rich, poor, black, white, man, woman, God will use you. If you're willing and able, it's one thing to be willing. It's another thing that God cannot use you if you're ignorant. It was there are the Jews had great fervor for God, Romans chapter 10, but they were going about eventually to establish their own righteousness because they did not understand nor accept the righteousness of God that was in Christ Jesus. And oftentimes churches go about ignorantly trying to do the work of God, but they're not doing that according to the divine righteousness of God, not according to the word of God. There is a way to do things. There is a means and a method. When it comes to our salvation, our service unto God is like the marriage vow, till death do us part. <clears throat> anyway, I won't make any smart remarks there. I thought about a few, but I won't do it. <laughs> till I can find the sign out. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Strike that. <clears throat> but God's purposes were ordained before any of creation was spoken into existence. And he talks about those purposes in verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And of course that would have been in eternity past. This was stuff was not new to God. He's always known all things at all times. As far as that goes, the Son has too. But God's purposes were ordained before any of creation was spoken or fashioned into existence. Before he made the devil, before he made the planets or anything. So no plans of mankind or devil have the power to forestall the plans of God. Knowing that helps you as a believer press on in faith, even in the hardest of trials and tribulations. And it is the resident Bible doctrine or the teaching of the word of God that you have received by faith, not just intellectually, but you have received it in your human spirit where His Spirit bears witness with your spirit, teaching and testifying and comforting and guiding. In that way, there is this whole circle of trust being developed between you and God. There is an orbit of trust being developed. between You getting this, folks? There is an orbit of trust being developed between you and God. And when I don't live in that orbit, I'm not fooling anybody but myself. But when I live in that orbit, I am being conformed to Christ's image. And it's going to come out in how I talk, how I act, how I think. Same for you. And that reminds you that regardless of what happens, you are a winner either way. Please remember 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 14, thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are getting saved. And in them that perish, we're still a sweet savor. To one, we are the savor of death unto death. Our witness stands as a condemnation to their refusal to believe. They all have to answer for it one day. The people that you witness to one day answer for rejecting your witness. 
And for those who receive the word and are saved, we are savor of life unto life. And God is sufficient for these things. That's important to remember that. So you don't quit when things don't seem right. And Paul was brings this into focus when he says uh, in verse 13, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations. In Christ, verse 12, he says, we have this boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. So now Paul is preparing the reader to see his heart as he is about to enter into his second prayer in this epistle, which spans from verses 14 through 21, which we'll jump into next week. But now there is a personal connection every believer has to access the Lord at his throne in the heavenlies where you can pray by confidence, by faith in him. You can pray knowing that he hears your prayers, that you can be bold in your faith in him. No need to be faint hearted when you come before your master, your Lord and Savior. Because if you're searching out the will of God, He is pleased beyond measure that you're there. Yes, He forgives us when we come to Him and say, Lord, I, I really messed up. I got involved with sin. I did this. I did that. I, I got used to a habit that I shouldn't have gotten used to. I got used to saying things I ought not say. And Lord, I realize I've, I've been slipping up and I'll confess that unto you. And now metanoia is the result or a turning about, change of mind with a corresponding change of action. I'm not doing a 360. I'm doing a 180. By the power of God, I'm going to do that. And that's going to involve a change in my life. And sometimes we need a change in our life to get set on course. Does it do any good to confess our failures if we're not willing to change? Just empty words. But when we come in honesty to the Lord, there's no need to be faint-hearted. He's not only there to forgive, but also to guide and steer us. And He, the, he does that. I'm thankful for that. But He doesn't play these little you know, sentimental games with us. He wants to know if we're serious. But then verse 13 says, He says, Wherefore, because you have this boldness, this access of confidence by faith in Him, this raised Jesus from the Lord, this one who's above all principality and power, who's manifold, manifold, shows the manifold wisdom of God. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations. Paul counted it as a privilege what he was doing as a servant, as we said last week. So wherefore, I desire that you faint not. We're getting down to the end of the message now. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not. At my tribulation, the word faint not is a an infinitive in the Greek. It's a present active infinitive. And it actually comes from the word for the word evil or kakos. Faint not at the evil that has come upon me in my tribulations. I go through my tribulations because of you. You are worth it, he said. You are worth me going through undeserved suffering. How many people will make a statement like that? You are worth suffering for. And so Paul is trying to tell the church at Ephesus and Laodicea, don't give in to evil. That would be evil for you to lose faith when you see me suffer because that makes my suffering useless in a way. Take advantage of it. Look at that as a badge of honor. The words faint not. It's the word may and kraken. And it means to behave badly or as I call it the kraken. To behave badly. In other words, don't behave badly because something bad has happened to me. I'm living the life a Christian should live. Don't use that as an excuse to either quit the word and quit the church and quit serving the Lord and quit selling, telling the gospel. Use it as an impetus to do the right thing and keep on doing the right thing. You see, bad things happen to good people. Jesus is the prime example of that. We shouldn't be shocked by that. Bad things happen to righteous people. Jesus Christ is the supreme example of that. And we know He said to His disciples in 
John 15, verses 18 through 25, that no servant is greater than his master. If they've hated me, they will hate you if you live the right way as I want you to live. Jesus Christ did not give in because he was hated. And many such as Paul did not give in either. Neither must we. You can't lay down or the Putins of this world will run all over you. There are always going to be the devil's servants in this world, his minions, his toadies who carry his water. You will always have that, whether they're some little goofball at school, some little goofball on the workplace, some goofball in your family, or some goofball in the church. There will always be Satan's minions, his toadies, carrying his water, trying to take away your joy, trying to take away your center of purpose in life. And you have got to be so sound in the word of God that they will fear you. Mess with me. Come mess with me. You will understand what I'm going through. And there are a lot of Christians who do not understand the passion for which I speak or how I speak because they have never stood the places that I have stood. And I bet you've got places where you have had to stand in the faith too and be strong in the Lord. And the Lord will have you to cast your eyes on somebody one day and they will not push you. Have you ever been before someone you, you did not mess with? I don't care if she was a little small woman. She gave you the eye. Oh, my word. Have you ever been around anybody like that? I have. I'm married. To, no. <laughs> but you be that person that is a person of integrity. Yeah, you're going to be shamed for it. You're going to have people castigate you for it. It's because they're small. It's because they're caught up in the cray-cray. They need you to be that person that's strong. And Paul, the early church did not get started because it was easy. All but one was killed. Just think about the heritage of your of the church. Every one of the apostles except for John was killed, and they tried to kill him in boiling oil. That was Domitian's contribution to the church. Or at least attempted contribution. God says, no, I'm going to keep it boy alive. I got something for him to do. It's called, write the gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. All written within five years of each other. Hmm. You don't give in because I'm going to tell you, as I said earlier, that Christianity is not for the weak of heart or the faint of heart. You are going to be persecuted for living a faithful life unto the Lord. And it's better for you to know that than for me to tell you a lie or to soft pedal it. Second Timothy 3.12, I'm not going to soft pedal it. They didn't soft pedal it then. And the problem that we have in Christianity, why the apostasy is so widespread is because Christians are afraid to call out people when they are doing something that is wrong. They're afraid, ministers are afraid to call out those who are of their profession when they are doing something that is apostate because they don't want anyone to be offended. Well, they are offending Jesus. They are offending God by not opening their mouth and saying something. And a lot of people don't like a Christianity like that because they don't feel comfortable. To be honest with you, I don't feel comfortable any other way. Honoring God in this world is honoring Jesus Christ and His Word. None of us are better than the other. And I'm not saying that it's easy for me either because it isn't sometimes. And I'm sure that you have hard times with it at times as well. And maybe sometimes you just go right on through and say, it's not that I don't care, it's just that it's not that important. And that's, and that's true. The world is not going to take kindly when your standards align with God's Word. Because the world is under the sway of the devil. And the cosmic system is under that influence. Tribulations, we close here, is from the Greek word thebo. That's not Tim, 
It's T-H-I-B-O. It's from that word thalipsis. Tim Thebo. No, no, that's just... <laughs> Thephacin is the way the long-term word is here, and then it's from the root word Thebo, T-H-I-B-O. And this means distressing circumstances. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my distressing circumstances. That in other words, I'm between a rock and a hard place. A catch-22. I am being pressed by this. In other words, it's a picture of a weight pressing hardly against you. And all God is saying is, surrender to it. There's a term in the military for it, but I can't use it here at the pulpit. But I'll close with this, Colossians 1.24. Paul speaks of these sufferings as the sufferings of Christ not yet filled up. Here's the spoiler alert, folks. <laughs> spoiler alert, Colossians 1.24. Spoiler alert. Verse 23 of Colossians 1 says, If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature that is under heaven, of which I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Here's the spoiler alert. The suffering of the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago is over. Okay? That suffering is over. It's over. As you have in your note there, the suffering of the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago is over. But the devil's celebration party is not. This means the sufferings of the cross go on for those yet walking in the faith. Remember, the devil's going to have a Christmas party in the middle of the tribulation period when the two witnesses are supposedly killed. Remember that. So the devil is still celebrating the crucifixion of Christ. He still thinks though Christ may have raised, the church is dead. Well, that would mean that Christ is dead because he's living in us. And if we're dead, then He's dead. The suffering of the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago is over, but the devil's celebration party is not, which means the sufferings of the cross goes on for those yet walking in the faith. For the believer to continue to walk in the faith, we need a deep understanding of the presence of God in our lives on a personal basis. I can't do that from the pulpit. You can't do that for me. We all got to do it for one another, ourselves and the Lord. This is where the following prayer of Paul needs to be learned by every believer. And we'll get to that, Lord willing, starting next, next week on that prayer. But there is so much of which God wants us to understand because we are loved so much by God. It's amazing how much God loves us. That's why the uh, disciple and eventually the apostle John was known as the one who said <coughs> he's the one whom Jesus loved. Why would that be said in his own, uh, own, own letter? Because John understood just how much the Lord loved him. He didn't just look at the Lord as someone who needed him to get a message across to others. He just understood the love of God. And when it came to the crucifixion of Christ, he was the only one present at the cross. He was the only one known to be present at the cross. And there he stood, Jesus, with Jesus' mother Mary. The rest of them were nowhere to be found. I'm sure they were around the area, but John was standing right there. One of the youngest ones, and if not the youngest one of the disciples. Right there. He understood how much that Jesus on that cross loved him and what he was doing for him. He understood that. He didn't worry about the religious ramifications. Yes, he was fear afraid at first too, and he scattered with the rest too at the time of the trial. But he came back quickly with Mary and was there with her. And, and Jesus ended up telling John, you take my mother with you and you take her into your home and, and, and you look out for mom. And I believe they moved to Ephesus and there John pastored for years. Timothy pastored there for years. 
If you know how much the Lord loves you, and if I know how much the Lord loves me, I'm not going to let anybody step in front of that love. You know, we know that God loves us and He lets nothing, as Romans chapter 8 says, come between God's love and us. Well, we should let nothing come between our love and God, to God. And, we, and I have to test that in my own personal life, as you must as well. And my own outward life as well. All of us do. Well, we have a great heritage and we have a great uh, life ahead of us in Christ, whether it's in this life or the life to come. Let's continue to keep the believers who are suffering overseas, especially those in Ukraine and other areas, and those early, those close NATO com- countries as well. Let's ask for God uh, to give us, uh, give them peace, uh, and that church to give them strength. Help them to understand that the love of God has not left them. Yes, that's seen often in our actions, but help them to understand that. We pray that we we'll make that part of our prayer as we had this morning. So let's pray. Father, we thank You for this day and for Your continued blessings on us. We thank You for Your care. We thank You for giving us enlightenment in truth so that we can understand in our spirit what Your Spirit is teaching us, what Your Word has for us. We thank You that we are on the winning team that uh, the playbook has already been written and that as we read and learn from your playbook, the Bible, that we are given encouragement and we are given a sense of conviction in our conscience, making it easier for us to make the choices that are right for your glory and for our good. Father, we pray for our nation. We pray that your hand and your divine providence will protect us Regardless of what's going on in politics, your divine hand will protect us. If not just us, but at least you will protect the church from the uh, oppression of powers and principalities. That if you allow powers and principalities oppression through our nation and whatever else to take place, that we will stay in the word and we will fight the good fight as early Christians did and we will hold the line. We will hold the ground that we've gained in Christ, that we'll not give up anything in Christ, in the Word, in our conviction to the doctrines and the teachings that your Word has given us, so that the Word may be honored above all things. Thank you again for this day. Father, we pray for everyone here that they all know that Jesus Christ is their Savior. That if something terrible should happen this week, with all the craziness that's going on, that if someone should lose their life this week, that they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they have heaven as their eternal home. We pray that each one knows Jesus Christ as their Savior, that you have said yes to Jesus Christ, that you know that you're a sinner, that He died for your sins, that He was buried, He rose the third day according to the Scriptures. If you but tell that to God, God will save you for all eternity. Give you His Spirit to indwell you, to comfort you, to teach you, to guide you, and to make you see things that you would never have imagined from this world. Thank you again, Father, for your word. Use us for your glory this week. In Christ's name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen.